Hello, my name is Robin. I'm an early years teacher and a PhD candidate with Charles Sturt University in Australia. My presentation is titled Fulfilling Children's Right to Actively Engage with the Local and Broader Community of Their Early Childhood Education Service. I would like to acknowledge that this is Wiradjuri land, the land on which I live and work. There has been considerable advancement in rights-based policy in early childhood education in Australia. However, existing literature has not fully explored how educators enable the rights of preschool aged children in daily practice. In 2019, as part of my qualitative research project, I undertook fieldwork visits to four early childhood education services within Australia. I was investigating educators' conceptualisation and enactment of children's rights in exemplary early childhood education services. Two preschools and two long daycare services participated in my study, situated in both rural and urban environments. These sites were purposefully selected from those awarded the exceeding national quality standard rating in the Australian National Quality Standards Assessment and Rating process. This selection mirrored the selection process from the larger study that mine is nested within. A further criterion was an expression and demonstration of explicit rights-based philosophical views with the aim of learning from educators who demonstrate exemplary practice. I collected data from 25 educators engaged in daily practice with preschool aged children in field visits spread over several weeks involving recorded interviews, focused discussions, photos, videos and observational note-taking. My findings were positive. While educators' knowledge and understanding of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child varied, I observed educator practices aligned with the Convention and each service's practices drew upon their unique context. One particular finding was significant and is the focus of this presentation. This image, a visit to the art gallery, and those images following accurately represent this finding. Each early childhood education service in my study demonstrated a commitment to and a history of active community engagement. Community engagement is acknowledged as a feature of many Australian early childhood services. What was striking about these four services was the embedded belief that children had a right to be actively engaged and visible within the local and broader community of their service. Educators expressed that fulfilling this right would be a benefit to the children and the community, to the wider world now and in the future. However, the Convention does not contain an explicit article that states children have a right to be involved in and connected with their community. So I sought to understand what the origin of this educator belief was and how this sat within the Convention. The preamble of the Convention states, convinced that the family, as the fundamental group of society and the natural environment for the growth and well-being of all its members and particularly children, should be offered the necessary protection and assistance so that it can fully assume its responsibilities within the community. And the child should be fully prepared to live an individual life in society. Article 12 of the Convention recognises the child's right to form and express their own views in matters that affect them. Article 28 recognises children's right to an education. Article 29 recognises education should prepare children for a responsible life. Article 31 recognises the child's right to participate freely in cultural life and the arts and Article 34 recognises their right to rest, leisure and play. In general comment number 7, 2005, implementing the child rights in early childhood, point 6 states, early childhood is a critical period for realising children's rights. During this period, young children's experiences of growth and development are powerfully shaped by cultural beliefs about their needs and proper treatment and about their active role in family and community. So what was happening within these services? Most significant at each service was a particularly long history of community engagement and connections. One service, the most established of the four, had been an integral part of its local community for 120 years. Some traditions at each site were retained each year. Visits to particular spaces or particular incursions were expected, valued and talked about by siblings and families. These were celebrations, like rites of passage, that were spoken about and handed on through generations. Some of the service's outdoor environments were small, 
the larger spaces like local parklands or partnerships with schools or organisations were sought for spaces that were more diverse and challenging. One service accessed an appropriate space to hold a forest school. These spaces also offered opportunity to build an awareness and love of the natural environment, learn about local Indigenous culture and opportunity for more physical and risky play. These became extensions of the playground and familiar and comfortable places for the children. This image was taken at an annual community event attended by one of the services. It was the National Simultaneous Storytime and on this day the storybook was delivered for the reading by a parachutist. Regularly the services also engaged in visits to aged care services, museums and theatre productions, restaurants and cafes, fire stations and farms, parklands and waterways, community centres, gardens and libraries and engage with Indigenous elders and community members. Invitations were also extended to local artists and to family members to visit the services to share their skills. For example, I observed a parent who was a local weaver who visited to dye wool with the children using gum leaves, vegetables and flower petals. Children's voices were encouraged and heard within the urban and regional communities. This building was of great interest to the children on their walks in a regional community and it instigated a project titled The Broken Windows. The local council asked the community to have their say about what to do with the old building, so this service asked their children. An educator told me that they sent three pages of submissions into the council and the council was very surprised. A positive consequence of this action was the development of a children's charter for this regional city. It hangs proudly on the wall of the service along with the floor books depicting the story of the children's civic engagement with the iconic building. Of particular importance to one service was the disconnect that existed between the service community and families. The urban community structure had changed over the years due to a sell-off of surrounding public housing. Thus, many families travelled long distances to attend the service, building a connection and sense of belonging to this local community was not, that was not their own, was significant to the director and educators. Children often travelled in cars to the gates of the service, so their exposure to the local community was limited and would it not be for the experiences and exploration enabled by their educators they would not see outside the gates. This service engaged with a local artist to create a war wheel in a community space which depicted a map of the community that was drawn by the children. This image is an example of broader community engagement. This is a bark letter that hangs proudly in the foyer of an urban service. It was written to the then Australian Prime Minister, Mr Malcolm Turnbull, MP, to express the service's support for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Although the Convention does not have a specific article stating children's right to engage with their community, I argue that these educators' practices are assisting to fully prepare these children to live an individual life in society, as outlined in the Convention Preamble. More importantly, educator practices are positioning children as active and engaged citizens now in the local and broader community of their early childhood education service. The children are developing a sense of belonging to groups and communities, their family and their home community, plus their early childhood service community both locally and more broadly. They are also developing an understanding of the responsibilities associated with being an active participant, a right holder and a bearer of rights in society. On one of our city walks, the children watched from above the process of cleaning the windows. I remember thinking at that time, this is not a job for me. There are many practices that this worker employs in his daily work, practices to keep himself safe, Practices to ensure efficient cleaning of the windows. Practices unique to this particular job. As an early years educator, there are many practices that are unique to my role. Chemists, 2018, stated that, through our practices, we participate in the community of life on the planet. My study uses Chemists and Grutenberg's 2008 theory of practice architectures as an analytical framework. The practices of the educators at the services in my study contributed to creating a culture of active community engagement that was unique to each site and local context. Educators viewed children as agentic, competent and capable, and expressed an expectation that enabling and respecting the rights of the children now would have long-term benefits for the children's future. 
Educators believed that by embedding in daily practices, experiences for children to be responsible, cooperative and engaged community members who contributed to society in positive ways, this would become a continuum for their lives. Chemist et al, 2014, expressed that education has a double purpose, to help people live well in a world worth living in. This view highlights an individual's responsibility for their actions and an awareness of the impact their actions have, not only immediately, but for the future and long-term good of all in the world. This is a mutual responsibility to oneself and to others and an awareness that as social beings, dependent on relationships and mutual understandings between individuals, the social, moral and political consequences of our actions make history. The role of educators from this perspective is twofold. To initiate children's learning and forms of thinking so they will then foster and consider both collective and individual interests locally and globally. I determined that a sound or detailed knowledge of the Convention is not required to enact children's rights. Knowledge of and engagement with the Convention varied at each service and accordingly the Convention was recognised by educators as a legal act. Educators predominantly drew upon the Australian early childhood policies and regulatory documents which are grounded in rights-based practices such as belonging, being and becoming, the Early Years Learning Framework, the National Quality Standards, the Early Childhood Australia Code of Ethics and Supporting Young Children's Rights Statement of Intent and at one site the Reggio Emilia approach. The data suggested the foundation of this knowledge and engagement with the Convention stemmed from the personal values and beliefs and deep rights-based philosophical position of the leaders of each service. Educators recognised the articles of the Convention as convergent with their own moral and ethical positions. This moral stance, suggested by Chemist and Smith, sees educators being guided by this position to perform acts that are prudent, wise and in the best interests of the individual and humankind. Through active engagement within the local and wider communities of their early childhood education services, educators are also meeting several sustainable development goals. All of the experiences that children engage in foster and support their health and well-being as children are physically active and connected socially. The four services believe children have a right to quality education. Each service has high expectations of their educational practices as demonstrated by their award of the exceeding rating. Professional development was ongoing for educators. Both urban and rural services were committed to children's active community engagement and advocated for children to have a voice in planning and development of community spaces now and into the future. And at the time of my data collection, the climate change action marches were gaining momentum around the world. When, when I asked an educator what her hopes were for the children in her care now and their future, she commented, that she wished the children to continue being competent citizens and to be like the children in those marches, to stand up for what they believed. She felt confident the children in her care were capable of this. Do you remember that earlier image of the children visiting the art gallery and the bright painting? Well, at this visit, we also met this man, Mr Thomas Thorpe. Thomas had a long and influential career as an educator and now volunteers at the gallery. I contacted Thomas after this visit to seek his permission to use this photo and for his perspective on children visiting this space. I received a generous response. Thomas believes that children are very fortunate with their early education, that children should be welcomed into galleries and galleries should not be places of oppressive silence. He also wrote, Yes, art deserves to be studied for its own sake, for its own worth, but it should also be viewed and considered as an essential part of life, not something apart, like an added option. Even with very young children, an effort should be made to relate at least some of the artworks they have been looking at to their own lives. In this 30th year of Australia's ratification of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, I have high hopes that children's participation within the communities mentioned here is expected, accepted as normal and as their right. There is, of course, reciprocity in action when children engage with and visit community spaces the wider public's greater acceptance of young children as right holders. I again draw your attention to General Comment No. 7, 2005. It states that respect for the young child's agency as a participant in family, community and society is frequently overlooked or rejected as inappropriate on the grounds of age and maturity. I believe that these four early childhood education services are not overlooking the agency of the children in their care. 
These educators are meeting the preamble convention and the specific articles listed earlier. Through their practices, they are fulfilling children's rights now to live an individual life in society and assume the responsibility that this entails. This research and this particular finding will enhance our understanding of how the convention can be a framework that reflects and engages the local context of individual early childhood education services, the children, the families, educators and the wider world. Educators are in a unique position to embed the articles of the convention and the general comments into their everyday practices. In the words of Corison and Page, a rights-based framework provides equity and opportunities for all children to achieve learning outcomes and actively participate as a citizen here and now and in the future. Thank you.